Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Epigenomic Profiles of Asthma. I'm Rachel Brown of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window, or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ivana Yang received a PhD in chemistry from UNC Chapel Hill, followed by a postdoctoral training with John Quackenbush in functional genomics. She is currently an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Colorado School of Public Health, and National Jewish Health. The focus of her research over the past 12 years has been on genomic profiles and pulmonary fibrosis, asthma, and an and innate immunity. In this work, she has identified molecular subtypes of pulmonary fibrosis, gene expression profiles of environmental exposures in asthma, and DNA methyl methylation changes associated with the development of asthma and pulmonary fibrosis. She currently ex expanded her research program to encompass epigenetic regulation of gene expression in other diseases and exposures including metabolic disorders, including metabolic disorders. Her talk today will focus on asthma epigenics. I will now turn it over to Dr. Yang for her presentation. Hello, thank you, Rachel, very much for that kind introduction. So what I would like to do is uh, spend the next 45 minutes or so telling you about some of the work that we've done in epigenomic profiles of asthma. I will start by introducing uh, the disease and why we care to do this research. Asthma is a major public health problem. It affects a large number of children and adults worldwide. Um, it is more prevalent among children and minorities, um, and so that creates um, a major public health issue. Uh, for example, from 2001 through 2009, asthma rates rose the most among black children, almost a 50% increase. Um, the cost of asthma continues to increase um, every year. And what is really interesting, if you look at the graph that I have on the slide, is, um, and I'm hoping that you can see the colors of the lines, is that the most, uh, the most, uh, the highest rise in asthma has been in westernized countries, suggesting that it has to be the environment and not genetics, because our genetics does not change that quickly, um, or, and especially in westernized countries, that's leading to this increase in prevalence. Um, one of the major issues in terms of trying to understand uh, genetic and environmental basis of asthma is that it's a very heterogeneous disease. So this is a figure from one of the review papers that Sally Wenzel, a leader in the field of asthma uh, clinical research, has uh, published. And you can see here, you don't have to look at every single um, um, subtype of asthma, but there are many subtypes. Um, some are specific to childhood, some are specific to adults, and then there's some overlap. Um, and there is a range of severity of disease as well. Um, asthma is a complex immunological disease. Um, most of the time, asthma is characterized by uh, uh, Th2 cell, T cell response. However, this figure illustrates that it's not only Th2 cells, but other cell types uh, that can lead uh, to different subtypes of asthma. So some of the heterogeneity of asthma un, um, is um, founded in some of the immune heterogeneity as well. Um, one important um, piece of information to tell you before I start telling you about the work that we've done in asthma epigenetics is that 
the environment and genetics do not um, generally um, act directly on those immune cells, the T cells that I just mentioned. Rather, this is um, mediated through the airway epithelium. So what happens is when an individual is um, exposed to allergens or other environmental exposures, is that there is damage to the airway epithelium, and this leads um, downstream to some of the immunolo immunological changes. So when I start telling you about our work, I will focus on two, um, two uh, uh, several projects, but all of them are, will be in either immune cells or epithelial cells. Um, importantly, asthma is an environmental disease. So this um, slide tells you a little bit about some of the exposures that um, have been associated with asthma. The most prevalent exposures are allergens, house dust mite pollens, ragweed, cockroach mold. Um, however, there are uh, non-allergen forms, uh, non-allergen induced forms of asthma. Um, air pollution is especially uh, relevant to these non-allergen induced forms of asthma. Um, exercise, aspirin, infections. Um, when we talk about environment in asthma, we talk about both in utero exposures. So, um, for example, in utero exposure to cigarette smoke increases child's risk of developing asthma. Um, at the same time, if maternal diet is rich in um, oily fish and fruits and vegetables, um, kids are pretty, uh, kids have less um, risk for asthma. So in addition to direct exposures that I just mentioned in terms of allergens and other uh, factors, in utero exposures are also important. In addition to being an environmental disease, asthma is a genetic disease. Um, estimates of heritability in this disease are 36 to 79 percent, and a number of GWAS, genome-wide association studies, have been done recently to identify genetic variants uh, that are associated with the risk of asthma. Um, some of these studies have been very large. They're meta-analyses of multiple studies. So we're talking um, tens of thousands of patients and very sophisticated um, genetic chips that have over a million variants uh, covered on the chips. But despite all of this, genetic variants that have identified through GWAS explain a small portion of disease heritability. So where is this missing heritability? Um, the field of asthma is currently focusing on two areas, uncovered rare variants. So rare variants may be important um, in terms of genetic risk of asthma. And the other part, it may be epigenetic marks. So our lab um, has been uh, looking at epigenetic marks in asthma. So what are epigenetic marks? Epigenetic marks are um, both consist of DNA methylation and histone modifications. So they're not in the DNA sequence itself, but they're modifications to either DNA or histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. And so what they do is they um, ensure that genes are expressed in the right, at the right time, at the right place, and in the right amount. Um, what the different methylation and histone modification marks will lead to either areas of open chromatin, such as this area here. Let me see if I can use an arrow to point it. Um, so this area here is open chromatin. This is where transcription occurs. So DNA is accessible. Um, uh, RNA polymerase can come in, and you get uh, ex gene expression. These areas that are closed chromatin, um, there's lack of gene expression because RNA polymerase cannot come in and uh, initiate that transcription. So epigenetic marks control whether the chromatin is open or closed. Um, epigenetic marks are really important in a number of very basic cellular processes. So and um, at the level of the organism, not just cellular. So for example, they are responsible for X chromosome inactivation in females. As you know, um, females have two copies of the X chromosome, but we do not have twice as much expression of the genes that are encoded on the X chromosome. 
And the reason is epigenetics. Um, so epigenetic marks silence transcription from one of the copies of the X chromosome. Um, epigenetic marks are also very important in regulation of tissue-specific gene expression. So genes that are expressed in the lung are not expressed in the colon, for example, and that's regulated by um, epigenetics. Um, as I mentioned already about asthma, the same is true for epigenetic marks. Environmental exposures, both in utero and direct, lead to changes in epigenetic marks. And finally, um, epigenetic marks, this regulation of these epigenetic marks has been associated with disease. Um, a number of studies for a long time have been done in the field of cancer at looking at epigenetics in cancer. But more recently, non-malignant diseases such as asthma and other uh, lung diseases and um, diabetes and so on, um, researchers in this field have started looking at epigenetics. In addition to um, being regulated by the environment, epigenetic marks are also important in differentiation of T cells. So if you remember a number of slides ago, I told you that uh, asthma is characterized, allergic asthma is mostly characterized by Th2 response, exaggerated Th2 response. But there are other forms of asthma with other Th um, cell subtypes. Well, what's really important to know is that these um, the um, differentiation of a naive CD4 positive T cells to different lineages, so how the cell um, is going to become, whether the cell will become Th1, Th2, Th17, this is regulated by um, epigenetics. So transcription factors that regulate these, um, the, uh, transcription factors and cytokines, as a matter of fact, that regulate this um, differentiation are also epigenetically regulated. So an example of that is uh, shown in this slide. Um, there are two um, genes that are shown here, um, TBET1, a transcription factor that's important in Th1 cell lineage, and um, GATA3, which is a transcription factor important in Th2 cell lineage. On the top, the Th0, um, so unpolarized, uh, undifferentiated cell, has both green and red um, histone modifications. So um, red, green histone modifications on this slide depict those that um, are permissive and lead to open chromatin and gene transcription, versus red, um, similar to a stop sign, uh, means that um, they uh, repress transcription. So what you can see on the left is in Th1 cells, um, the Tbet1 um, gene only has green um, histone modifications. So it is expressed in Th1 cells. On the other hand, in Th2 cells, it is GATA3 that is expressed because um, it has only green um, histone modifications. So this simple illustration just tells you how this works in terms of uh, cell differentiation. So to put together all the background that I've told you about and our thoughts on why epigenome is important in asthma, we think that epigenome is a critical mediator of both exposures and genetic susceptibility factors on transcriptional profiles and then this leads uh, to differences, or this is associated uh, with differences in Th um, cell skewing, which again is also regulated epigenetically. And this leads to uh, development of different forms of asthma. Um, on this slide, I only depict allergic and non-allergic asthma, but if you remember, there are a number of different subtypes. Um, so there generally two types of um, epigenetic marks that we um, think of traditionally, DNA methylation and histone modifications. However, non-coding RNAs are often put together um, and um, considered part of the epigenome. 
Um, just to remind you how these marks work, so DNA methylation, when uh, promoters of genes are um, unmethylated, that leads to transcription. When they are methylated, that leads to lack of transcription. This is a really basic uh, paradigm. However, more recent studies have shown that this is not always the case. So there is gene body methylation, so it's not only in promoters. And then sometimes you can have methylation and expression going in the same direction, not necessarily anti-correlated. Histone modifications are much more complex, and I'm not going to talk a lot about them today. I'm mostly focusing on methylation. But um, just to say that there are a number of different uh, modifications to histone tails. Some of them lead to open chromatin, so they're permissive. Um, or poised um, sometimes, so the promoters are poised for transcription. Um, and these are depicted in my slides as green, just like um, on the previous, on a couple of slides ago on um, the TH cells. Um, on the other hand, there are also a number of marks um, that on histone tails that lead to uh, repression of gene expression, so closed chromatin, and these are depicted in red. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about my coronates. Um, in any case, um, together, these um, epigenetic marks lead either to gene transcription on the left or lack of gene transcription on the right. So to start to test um, our hypothesis that epigenetic marks are important in asthma, our group did a mouse animal study a number of years ago. Um, so we tried to um, test this hypothesis that the epigenome is a key um, mediator of the environmental exposure in the context of a genetically vulnerable host and that this leads to environmental asthma. So um, this slide summarizes some of the evidence that I already discussed why we had this hypothesis. So um, epigenetics and asthma both have in common that they have non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance, they have parent of origin effects, they're influenced by the environment, affected by in utero exposures, and alter or involve maturation of T cells. So our specific hypothesis for this study was that methylation marks skewed towards a Th2 phenotype by altering the transcriptional activity of critical genes that enhance the risk of allergic airway disease. Uh, we tested this uh, hypothesis in um, a mouse model where pregnant females were fed high versus low methyl um, donor diet. Um, and what we saw were differences in asthma phenotypes. So um, in the progeny, so in the F1 progeny, so uh, mice born to these mothers on different diets um, had, um, if, they were, uh, if their mothers were on high methyl diet, they had more airway resistance. So this is um, in response to inhaled metacholine. So this really um, is relevant to asthma in terms of um, the um, airway constriction. Um, compared to low methyl donor um, diet mothers that had a lot less uh, airway resistance. Um, the, this, the same was true for um, allergic inflammation. So mice um, whose mothers were fed high methyl donor diet had more eosinophils um, and IL-13 in the lavage fluid from their lungs. Um, and I should have mentioned all of this was done in an um, animal model of allergic airway disease, um, house dust mite model. So all these animals were sensitized and challenged to house dust mite. The differences between groups were really just the diet of the mother. Um, these phenotypes were transmitted to the F2 generation. Um, and we did a genomic profile of uh, methylation, DNA methylation, and identified 82 hypermethylated, I apologize, loci, so more methylation um, as a result of high methyl donor diet including RUNX3, and RUNX3 is a transcription factor that's important in um, TH cell lineage. So this really ties back to some of the introduction that I um, talked about in terms of TH cells um, and um, TH um, cell lineage um, and um, epigenetic regulation and how this is linked to asthma.
Um, we also showed that expression of RUNX3 in splenocytes from these mice was restored by 5-ASA treatment. 5-ASA is a demethylating agent, so when DNA gets demethylated, so, so back to its um, normal state, um, the animals do not have um, as much asthma. Um, well, this study um, that was done in animals, in animals was really important. Um, some of the follow-up studies looking at methyl donors, specifically folate, so the biggest um, met, uh, methyl donor in terms, or the most important methyl donor in terms of supplementation is folate or folic acid. Um, and since we published this study in mice, there have been a number of um, human studies that have looked at association of maternal folate during pregnancy and uh, childhood asthma. Um, and the results have been mixed. So there are um, six references on this slide. Three were positive, three were negative, so really mixed results. Um, but one of the studies that measured, that did not look at just questionnaire data for folate, rather they measured serum folate in the, uh, in the mothers, um, showed a positive association. Um, so the jury, I think, is still out on whether folate, maternal folate is important in um, the risk of asthma in children. Um, but again, the study that we did in mice was important in the context of starting a research area of looking at epigenetic marks and childhood asthma. So that is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about. I will talk about four studies uh, that we have done um, looking at um, association of DNA methylation and childhood asthma in human cohorts. I will start by two studies relevant to um, immune cells, peripheral blood methylation and serum IgE levels, uh, PBMC methylation and allergic asthma in the inner city, and then I'll finish up by a couple of studies of looking at nasal epithelial cells. So remember, the epithelium is also, a respiratory epithelium is also important in asthma. Um, and I'll talk about uh, nasal epithelial cell methylation and allergic asthma in the inner city, as well as some very preliminary data on um, DNA methylation in monozygotic twins um, discordant for asthma. So the first study that I will talk about was uh, led by Bill Cookson and Maria Moffat in the UK. So we were collaborators on this study, and we worked on this for a while with them. Um, they have a unique cohort of uh, kids with asthma where they have discordant and concordant sibling pairs as well as some trios. And using this study design um, and profiling uh, DNA methylation on uh, Illumina arrays, so for 450K Illumina methylation arrays, we identified 36 loci that are significantly hypomethylated in peripheral blood of asthmatic SIBs compared to non-asthmatic SIBs. So on these Manhattan plots that I will show you, show you on the y-axis is negative log of the p-value, on the x-axis is the chromosome, and then the line of significance, uh, so in this case false discovery rate of uh, less than 0 0.01 is drawn. And in some cases, I don't have the line of significance, but I'll discuss how we uh, establish significance. So again, in this study, we identified 36 hypomethylated loci. Um, Bill and Miriam really approached this study um, as um, a genetic study. So what they did is, um, in addition to looking at the original population, so MRCA is the original population, they replicated these results in two additional cohort and performed a meta-analysis. And what you can see is that um, some of the low side that are listed here are highly significant in all three cohorts as well as in the meta-analysis. And all of them are related to um, immune systems. So IL-4 is very important in allergic asthma, IL-5 receptor um, as well, and so on. Um, some of the network analyses that they performed that I'm not going to talk about in detail um, showed that the eosinophils are the key cell type um, in the 
this analysis of peripheral blood and relationship to IgE, which makes sense because the eosinophils are the cell type um, that is associated with allergic asthma. So in addition to looking at whole blood methylation, as done um, on this slide, um, we also looked at um, specifically in the eosinophils um, because um, epigenetic marks are cell type specific. Um, and we were able to show that many of these loci that we identified in whole blood are also differentially methylated in eosinophils. So you can see that um, I'm showing you results for six loci, and all of them are hypomethylated in allergic asthmatics compared to controls. And asthmatics that are not allergic, so that they, who have low IgE, are somewhere in the middle. So this paper really established, it was um, the first epigenome-wide association study, or EWAS, um, in relation to uh, serum IgE um, and asthma, and really um, established that um, epigenetic marks are important in um, peripheral blood of um, children with asthma. In another cohort, um, this is now a slightly different cohort. These are African-American children. And if you remember from my first slide, I told you that um, asthma is more prevalent among African-American children. So this is why we focused on um, this uh, population. Um, we had peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs, from African-American children who live in inner cities. And we profiled 97 allergic asthmatic cases and 97 controls. This analysis identified 81 regions, differentially methylated regions, that are significantly associated with asthma. So the reason I don't have a uh, significant threshold on this slide is because these are regions, and the way we calculated p-values is by um, combining p-values of multiple probes within a region, so I'm sh demonstrating here with the arrows, um, and that is what was significant, not individual probes. Um, network analysis of these 81 differentially methylated regions showed hypomethylation, so in the same direction as our eosinophil study, less methylation, um, in key genes that are important in regulation of gene expression in asthma. Um, IL-13, for example, is a very important cytokine. Um, RUNX3, remember the transcription factor that I mentioned in our um, mouse study, is also hypomethylated in asthmatic children. Um, in addition to looking at DNA methylation, we also wanted to look at gene expression and how these uh, methylation marks affect uh, gene expression. Um, so in this very simple plot, I am plotting expression uh, fold change on the y-axis, and it's on the log 2 scale. And on the x-axis is methylation change, percent methylation change. Um, and what you can see is that um, I don't have a p-value for this enrichment, but there are more blue dots. So blue dots are um, for loci where a methylation and gene expression have inverse correlation. This is the canonical relationship of DNA methylation and expression. Um, versus red are going in the same direction. Another way we analyzed uh, methylation and gene expression data was by, com by combining expression and methylation T statistics in the, um, so doing statistical model with both in the same uh, model. And this analysis um, identified the, some of the same candidates that were identified by DNA methylation analysis alone, so RUNX3, IL-13, for example. But it also identified additional genes where we did not have enough power when we looked at just methylation data. But by combining with expression data, we see that, for example, IL-4, so a cytokine that was differentially methylated in a relation to IgE, as well as ST2, which is a, um, res the receptor for IL-33, another important cytokine in asthma. They're both um, hypomethylated and overexpressed. 
Um, so one of the key things that uh, we always have to do in terms of validation of these genomic uh, profiles is uh, technical validation and also external validation. So what I mean by that is replication. Um, does this replicate in a different population? Um, in this study, um, all the methylation marks that we identified were validated technically, so they are differentially ex methylated in the same kids. And we had partial external validation, so about 7 out of 10, so 70% of these were validated in an independent population. Um, Although I'm not talk, going to talk about histone marks a lot in this presentation, and our lab has not done a, a lot of work on histone modifications, I just wanted to mention this paper that came out at the end of last year uh, where um, epigenomic profiles, so enhancer profiles of Th1 and Th2 cells um, were published. Um, by another group because I think it's a really important resource and also what they were able to show is that um, Th1 and Th2 cells from asthmatics compared to healthy controls have very different enhancer profiles. So this goes together with our data on DNA methylation um, demonstrating that epigenetic marks are altered in asthma. Um, so the second part of my talk will focus on um, the respiratory epithelium. Um, as you, if you remember from my introduction, um, in addition um, to looking at um, immune cells, it's really important to look at the epithelium because it gets injured. Um, and this is how the allergens and other exposures um, get to the immune cells. Um, so in, a, in Children, it's very difficult to do bronchoscopies um, it's, and get um, airway epithelial cells. And for this reason, a number of researchers have started using nasal epithelial cells as a surrogate for um, airway epithelial cells. So in a seminal paper published by Max Seibold's group at National Jewish, one of my colleagues, it was shown that uh, the nasal transcriptome um, is very similar to the airway transcriptome and that this um, also, um, that there are changes associated with childhood asthma in the nasal transcriptome that are similar to uh, what happens in the airway transcriptome. Um, at the same time, there was another study um, by Andrea Baccarelli's group that um, showed uh, differences in DNA methylation in nasal cells of children with asthma compared to controls. Um, and similarly, a uh, paper from Pedro Avila's group showing that human rhinovirus infection causes different, uh, causes different DNA methylation changes in nasal epithelia of asthmatics compared to controls. So all of these uh, publications um, demonstrated that the nasal epithelium is a good surrogate for the airway epithelium. Um, and we started looking at um, the epithel nasal epithelial cells in our cohorts. Um, so the way we did this is um, we were able to collect uh, nasal epithelial samples on about half of the subjects that were enrolled in our original population of 97 cases and 97 controls that I um, talked about in the PBMC study. Of those, um, we selected 36 cases and 36 controls that have most pure columnar epithelia. Um, and this was accessed by FOXJ1 gene expression, and FOXJ1 is a transcription factor that's very specific to uh, ciliated cells. So the reason we do this is that we're really interested, when you do a nasal brushing, sometimes you get a mix of squamous and uh, columnar epithelia, and we're really only interested in columnar epithelia because the, those are the cells that uh, represent, that are similar to the airway epithelia. So we use this um, to identify only samples that are really representative of the airway epithelia. When we um, performed the genome-wide methylation profiling, um, we did this in the same way that we did it um, in the PBMC study as well as in the IgE 
uh, study. So it's Illumina 450K methylation arrays. Um, and this analysis identified a stronger signal than what we found in the um, PBMCs, although our population was smaller. So we identified 119 um, differentially methylated regions, or DMRs, that's plotted um, in the panel A of the figure on the Manhattan. And we also identified 118 single CPG sites that are associated uh, after adjustment for multiple comparisons. And what I should tell you that I didn't tell you before, in all our analyses, um, we run uh, linear models and we adjust for confounders such as um, age, gender, and ethnicity, and race, because we know that these um, can influence methylation. In addition to that, we do a lot of quality control, and uh, we um, deal with batch effects before we get to statistical models. So what are some of the genes that are differentially methylated in the nasal epithelia? Um, if you look at the differentially methylated regions and differentially methylated probes or positions, so these are, again, regions of sustained low p-values um, associated with um, asthma, or single CPG sites that are significant after adjustment for multiple comparisons. Um, there's some overlap, uh, which is not surprising. Um, there are about uh, 40 loci that overlap but there are um, 70 to 80 that are unique to the two analyses. And I think this really illustrates that it's important to look at the data in multiple ways uh, when you do these genomic profiles. Um, when we take the union of this Venn diagram that I'm showing you, we identify a number of genes that we know are important in asthma. So um, ALOX15 is one of the genes that's been associated with asthma extensively. Calpanes, um, histamine and methyl transferase is important in the allergic part, so allergy. Periostin is differentially expressed in the airway epithelium of um, asthmatics, and it's a biomarker that's be, that is being used uh, for asthma. We also see changes in methylation of genes related to extracellular matrix, immunity, cell adhesion, airway obstruction, um, obesity, which is also associated with asthma, so there is a subtype of asthma that's uh, related to obesity. Um, autophagy. So again, these are all um, cellular processes that we know are important um, in asthma. Um, when we compare these um, loci to those that we identified in PBMCs, only four of them overlapped. And they're not very exciting genes that we know are important in asthma. So what this really tells you is how important it is to look at different samples. Um, and this is not surprising given that we're looking at epithelial cells versus um, more immune cells in the PBMCs. Um, so it's not surprising that methylation changes are different given what we know about cell specificity of epigenetic marks. Um, these are just some representative plots of uh, the differentially methylated regions um, that we identified as um, associated with asthma. So on the y-axis is the methylation change, and then um, on the x-axis is genomic coordinate. So for example, methyl transferase like one, MET1, has only one probe that's um, associated with asthma versus um, MHC2, DP alpha one, for example, has a number of probes. So that's what's on the x-axis. Uh, what this histogram is of, um, is of the methylation marks in the or met, percent methylation estimate in 36 cases and 36 controls. So um, controls are in red, cases are in blue. And what you can see is that uh, three of the four representative loci that I'm showing you are hypomethylated in asthma, so less methylation in the blue compared to red, versus um, the HLA DPA1 locus is hypermethylated, so more methylation. I'm hoping that you can see the y-axis, um, and um, you, I'll also be able to illustrate this point on the next slide. But um, 
what's important here is that these methylation changes are larger. So when we looked at in PBMCs, uh, we found methylation changes between asthmatics and controls under order of 1 to 5 percent. So very small changes, very consistent but small. When we look in nasal epithelia, these are changes uh, from uh, ranging from 10 to 30 percent. And if you look at uh, epigenomic profiles in cancer, um, these uh, methylation change differences are approaching those identified in cancer. So again, this is, um, these are big changes. Um, because these are big changes, it was very easy to validate both internally, so technical validation, and externally by PIRA sequencing. Um, similar to our PBMC study, we also looked at a uh, relationship of DNA methylation and expression. Um, and this, this is exact same layout of the plots. Well, I just have two plots because I have regions and uh, single um, probes, single CPG sites. And you can see that there is um, an enrichment. So on this graph, I actually do have the p-values for the enrichment of um, hypomethylated uh, or uh, of inverse correlations of uh, methylation in gene expression, as we would expect. Um, we also analyzed the data slightly differently, focusing on what is differentially expressed. So we used genomic arrays to look at gene expression and identified four, 53 genes that are significantly differentially expressed in asthmatics compared to controls. Um, many of the genes that are differentially expressed are um, those that we know are important in biology of asthma. I mentioned ALX15 is differentially methylated. It's also differentially expressed. Um, there are a number of other genes that are related to asthma and allergy as well as immunity. Um, and some that have been shown to be consistently differentially expressed across multiple studies um, and some that are used as biomarkers. So looking at these 53 genes, and um, this is just uh, the plot that I'm showing you is uh, plots the expression uh, for asthmatics on the y-axis and on the controls on the x-axis. Um, the red dots are genes that are not differentially expressed, and then blue dots are the ones that are significantly differentially expressed with the the size of the dot being proportional to the fold change, so difference in gene expression. So what we wanted to do, while we're interested in expression, we're really mostly interested in how DNA methylation regulates this expression response. Um, so uh, what we did is we um, looked at um, methylation, a relationship of methylation and expression quantitatively um, just in these 53 genes. And after adjusting for multiple comparisons, we found that 32 out of 53, so 60% of the genes, have significant methylation expression relationships. Um, this is a significant enrichment uh, compared to, if we compare um, genome-wide how many significant methylation expression relationships we have, there's an enrichment in these genes that are differentially expressed. And these are predominantly canonical inverse relationships, 25 out of 32. Um, to begin to understand uh, the biology of um, these 32 genes, uh, we performed a network analysis using protein-protein interactome data uh, from the um, you, from the innate database of interactomes and using the network analyst um, tool that's available online. Um, in this network graph, genes that are upregulated in expression and hypomethylated, so less methylation, more expression, are in red, and inversely, genes that are Downregulated in expression and hypermethylated in terms of uh, methylation are in green. 
Um, and what you can see in this graph is that we identified a number of modules within this network um, with genes that we know are important in asthma. Um, so this um, RPK2 gene or RIPK2 gene is really important in innate immune response in relation to um, asthma and other immune diseases. CCL5 is a chemokine um, and so on. And some of the HLA genes are in here as well. Um, so again, this really illustrates how network analysis can help you find modules of important um, genes with both changes in differential expression and methylation. So what are some of the conclusions that we can draw from the studies that I've shown you so far? Uh, well, I think I've shown you that methylation marks regulate serum IgE concentrations and peripheral blood. Um, of asthmatic and non-asthmatic, compared to non-asthmatic children. Um, I showed you that methylation of PBMCs um, and nasal epithelia are associated with allergic asthma in inner city children. Um, I did, uh, it's important to remember that methylation marks in PBMCs and nasal epithelia are different, uh, which is, again, not surprising given how um, different these cell types are. Um, Importantly, I showed you that asthma-associated changes in um, methylation of nasal epithelia have a much larger signal com in comparison to PBMCs. So when uh, looking at, um, we know that we can't look at the lung of children with um, asthma, but in identifying surrogate, Tissue, the uh, tissue or sample that we can use, nasal cells are preferable to PBMCs. Um, I've shown you in all these studies that methylation changes are associated with changes in gene expression. And in my last study of the nasal epithelia, the genes that are expressed by the nasal epithelia in asthmatic children appear to be gen epigenetically regulated. Um, so while we think epigenetics is really important, it is also important to remember that epigenetics is just one of the, or the epigenome is just one of the pieces of the puzzle. And this slide, I think, demonstrates that, that really well, um, that it's important to look at um, the epigenome, the genome, transcriptome, but it's also um, microbiome. Um, nutrition and other uh, pieces that um, are important in um, asthma. So to start to be able to focus on the environment and a microbiome, uh, we just started a study um, in monozygotic twins. And why use twins? Well, the reason that we are using twins is that this really allows us, and especially monozygotic twins, is this allows us to remove the effect of genetics, and it allows us to focus more on the environment. Um, small epigenomic studies in twins in other diseases, and one um, that's been published in asthma, has shown increased power to detect associations. Um, and then using both monozygotic and dizygotic twins would also allow us to estimate heritability of asthma-associated methylation marks. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a study that we're really just beginning, and I have just the one slide of very preliminary data, but I think they're exciting data, and so I wanted to share them. So in a small study of all monozygotic twin pairs, 10 discordant for asthma, 10 concordant for asthma, so both twins have asthma, and 10 concordant for non-asthma, so both twins are non-asthmatic. Um, we performed a genome-wide methylation study, again using 450K methylation erased from Illumina, the same platform that I've talked about throughout the talk. And in this study, we identified 62 um, differentially methylated regions in nasal epithelia that are associated with asthma. What we thought was really interesting is that there is um, enrichment, um, so high percentage of genes um, in the 62 loci are um, associated with innate immunity. We did not see this in the other study, and we think it's because we are able now to focus in on this innate immune response to the environment because we've removed the effect of genet uh, genetics. Um, 
In very preliminary analyses, half of the DMRs, so differentially methylated regions, are associated with difference in endotoxin levels in the bedding dust. So endotoxin levels in the bedding dust are um, an environmental exposure. Endotoxin is part of gram-negative uh, bacteria, and so it shows uh, what is um, going on in the environment. And we also, in collaboration with Kathy Lozapone, a fantastic uh, microbiome researcher here at the University of Colorado, we looked at uh, the microbiome in the nasal epithelial cells, so in the same sample of these um, children. And we also were able to show that half of the DMRs are also associated with difference in abundance of some hydrocarbon degrading bacteria in the nose. Um, so again, um, this is very preliminary, very early, but I think it really illustrates um, how um, the right study design, in, term, in this case using monozygotic twin pairs, can help you identify um, important um, epigenetic marks um, when you're trying to focus on the environment. So what are the implications of, of um, what I've told you about today? Um, so we think methylation marks, especially in the nasal epithelia, could be used as biomarkers of asthma. However, um, it is really important to uh, realize that these studies are very early and that we need to better understand uh, the relationship of these methylation marks to disease activity, allergy, exposures, and treatments. Um, they also, we think, are novel targets for understanding biology of asthma especially given their relationship to gene expression, and their potential therapeutic targets since methylation can be modified. So let me finish up by just telling you a little bit about epigenetic therapies. Um, this is a summary slide from our recent or relatively recent review article that shows you all the um, therapeutics that are available for um, affecting DNA methylation and histone modifications. Um, so if you focus on DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, there are a number of them. They have been in clinical trials in um, cancers. Um, they have not been um, looked at in the context of non-malignant diseases yet, but they are available. Um, one of the problems with these DNA methyltransferase inhibitors is that they're nonspecific. So they will demethylate the entire genome or many loci in the genome, not just the locus that you're interested in demethylating. Some of the histone-modifying um, therapies are uh, more um, specific in the sense that they target the pathway. Um, however, none of them are specific to the point that we would want to say we would like to target, for example, just TH2 genes and asthma. Um, however, there's a lot going on in terms of using uh, genome editing technologies to develop locus-specific epigenetic therapies. And I'm just listing three studies um, that um, you can look more into in terms of how other labs are starting to use genome editing um, techniques such as CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology to, um, so what they do is they fuse the CRISPR domain to a uh, histone or DNA modifying enzyme domain and are able to affect methylation or histone modification just at a specific locus. Um, and it's really important to know that this is very early on in terms of development of these locus-specific um, therapies, but um, I think that they will be available in the future and um, we should, um, by then, we should know a lot more answers about how important epigenetic marks are in asthma um, and hopefully have all the results that would enable us to use some of these therapies in the future. So with that, I would like to finish my presentation. I would like to acknowledge individuals who have contributed to this work, and there are a lot of them. Um, first of all, in our laboratory, Beth Davidson and Corinne Hennessy did all the lab work. Brent Pedersen is a very talented bioinformatician who did all the analyses. Um, 
in terms of the inner city asthma consortium study, so these are children from the inner city with asthma. Um, there are a number of collaborators. These samples were collected across um, the country, um, and these are just the collaborators who have participated. Um, the MRCA cohort, so the study that I mentioned um, in terms of a relationship of IgE, serum IgE, and DNA methylation, was done um, by Bill Cooks and Miriam Alfad and Liming Liang. Uh, we were collaborators in this study. And then finally, um, the early study, uh, the early results that I showed you from our twin cap study, so this is a study of twins in Colorado and uh, in relation to asthma, I would like to acknowledge those investigators as well. Thank you for your um, attention and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Our first question reads, not being in the area of genetics, my question is why do we get dysregulation and methylation in the first place? Are there publications at addressing this question in any disease condition? That's a really good question. Um, there are a lot of publications. Um, the as I mentioned early on, really the longest, the disease that this has been studied the longest in is cancer. But other diseases, um, so if you just go to PubMed and put DNA methylation and diabetes, DNA methylation and um, obesity, DNA methylation and, I don't know, pick a disease, rheumatoid arthritis, you will see that there are now publications showing association of DNA methylation and um, changes in DNA methylation and um, disease um, development. Why do they happen? They're dysregulated um, probably for a variety of reasons. Um, some of them are in utero exposures, so um, I use the example of cigarette smoke, but in another study that I'm doing, we're finding this regulation of DNA methylation um, in kids whose mothers had gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Um, they can be uh, dysregulated by environmental exposures, so if you live in a polluted city, um, there may be dysregulation. Um, they are really focusing on the environmental piece, but also there are publications that demonstrate that genetic factors can also regulate DNA methylation. So if you have a genetic variant um, in a specific place in a genome, methylation marks around that genetic variant might be altered by the presence of that um, variant. Great, so it looks like that was the only submitted question, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 2015. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We, inv we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time, goodbye. <laughs>